Uh, let's see, as, as a, for the record of the recording, so it's not confusing, um, as we did earlier, I took some questions from everybody, and let's see how we can do it uh, answering them today. I don't know if I'll get through, <laughs> through them all or adequately answer them, but uh, we'll do our best. Now let's go to our passage again, though, and let's get ourselves oriented on, on the passage of what the Bible is talking about here in uh, Luke chapter 8. As we continue our series through the Gospel of Luke, and we're looking today, in some ways, at the parable of the sower. That's the famous bit here, in many ways. But I think it's more than just the parable of the sower here. We're actually looking at responses to the Word of God and responses to Jesus. And in some ways... Perhaps it's the last part of this passage in verse 20, uh, 19, 21, that really tells us what it's really about. When Jesus' family turn up, and he's told that they are there, and he says, well, who are my mother and my brothers? Who are my family? And in fact, rather than entitle this lesson, the parable of the sower, I wanted to entitle it, who is Jesus' family? Who is his family? I mean, Jesus was building a family, building a nation, you could say as well in some ways, but he was building a family. The people in uh, God's kingdom are called brothers and sisters. We call God our father, our Abba father, our daddy father. We're, we're a family. That's the idea church is meant to be, an expression of that, that we're family. And we share life together. So I think it's really about who is Jesus' family. Maybe that's the real focus of this passage. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, it's good to know who your family are, isn't it? Uh, and not to be surprised. Um, <laughs> you may have read in the news that Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, recently found out that the, the man he thought was his father was not. The man who raised him as his father. The man who it appears actually thought he was his father, <clears throat> actually, uh, was not his father. I think his father, is, uh, the chap who raised him, has long uh, passed on. <clears throat> but um, some evidence came out that uh, it might not be the case. So he, I think he went for a DNA test and it turns out that somebody else um, uh, is actually his father, who's also, I think, now dead. Um, he handled it, I think, very well. And his mother um, wasn't aware at the time. And it's, you know, she had um, done enough to get pregnant, but not with the man she married. And uh, there was this it's an interesting situation. But what a shock, what a shock to find out that the man you thought was your father was not. It's important to know who our family are. And I think it's true spiritually, that we know we are family, that we know we're God's children, and that we help others uh, to, to share in that privilege. So I think that's kind of really what it's about. At the beginning of the passage, though, let's go back to the beginning, <clears throat> we have a troop of women following Jesus and being with him, proclaiming, as he's going around proclaiming the good news, of the kingdom of God, and he's got the twelve and some women cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary, Joanna, and Susanna, and a number of others, helping uh, to support them out of their own means, which brings me to uh, one of the questions. Uh, let's have a look here. Now, um, here's a question for somebody. If these women were supporting them, what kind of jobs would they have at this time? Or is it just family income? And that's a good question, isn't it? Because in that culture, generally speaking, it, women were not independent in their means. However, we do know elsewhere in the scriptures that, for example, Lydia in Acts 16 is a dealer of shirt cloth. There's no bloke apparently around. So it was possible for women to be people around businesses. Granted that that was not in Israel in, in Acts 16, but nonetheless it was possible. Um, and clearly if... Uh, the husband was providing and then died. Women did have to find some means of work. Um, but it does seem, it seems to me, that when we're talking here about Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, there seems to be money there. If you're the manager of the king's household, you're probably fairly high up in the social strata and therefore probably have your own money. So it's not possible to know where the money came from for sure, but I'm guessing that it was money that was given to them, or perhaps they did inherit. Um, but they did that. Isn't it interesting that they do that in a culture where women were not as free as they are today? Um, perhaps Luke is emphasizing this, the significance of women being there, helping Jesus with his work, shows us that everybody's important. 
And even if some of us here feel today we're not very important to God, to the church, to one another, actually, in God's eyes, we're all equally important. And we all have something to give and contribute. I think that's perhaps part of the reason that these, uh, this is in, in, included here. Another question, how were the women cured of evil spirits and diseases? Hmm. Do we know what Jesus did and where that is in the Bible? Well, prior to this passage in Luke 8, we've had a lot of instances of Jesus performing many healings. He's raised the dead, uh, he's healed many of, uh, 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 he's cured people of evil spirits and uh, various diseases. Uh, we've had a number of, of incidences of that through uh, earlier chapters of Luke. The man healed with leprosy in chapter 5, healing a paralyzed man in chapter 5 and uh, other miracles. The impure spirit driven out in Luke 4. He's healing just many. It says crowds came in Luke chapter 4. And the people were looking for him and they kept coming out and finding him because they wanted to be healed. So we presume that these, uh, the women mentioned here that, that got what they needed from him. The seven, de seven demons coming out was earlier on in, in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, one of many cured of evil spirits and diseases. So. Uh, it's all over the Gospels that Jesus exhibits this power. It's quite exciting, I think. And so we see that. So that's um, that question on that. I think at the beginning, that's the, those are the ones that, that refer to the beginning. I can read most of these. And, uh, oh, here's one from Leah. This is for you, Leah, okay, on the recording. Okay, so how did they support him? Well, we've talked about that, so that's for you. And why did they come to see him? Why did the crowds come? Why did the crowds come to see Jesus? Well, I mean, someone who's doing these miracles, who wouldn't want to be there? I mean, it's, it's the biggest show in town. Mm. So I, I guess they'd heard the good news spreads fast, right? And they came. How did he travel? How did Jesus travel? Another question from Leah. I presume he traveled around from one town and village to another, so he wasn't on the tube. Uh, I guess he didn't have a car. Uh, I guess he traveled by foot, and perhaps he had a donkey from time to time, but most people, most of the time, did a lot of walking, which, uh, frankly, we could all do with doing more walking, including children like Leia and others, right? <laughs> we could walk a bit more. Uh, have you heard of the Fitbit thing? Yeah. Right, so... Uh, Debbie would be familiar with all this, being a fitness instructor and everything. And so Pe Penny has got me into this because she's got a Fitbit on her belt, which counts how many steps you do in a day, right? And I can't bear to be outdone by my wife. So I got one on my phone here, and uh, <clears throat> we have these sort of um, unofficial competitions. Uh -huh. And uh, you can offer challenges to one another, and, uh, and Penny's got some workmates who do the same thing. So we have a weekend warrior challenge that, that we're on this weekend. And, uh, so far today, how many steps have I done today? I'll tell you, uh, 5,195 today. Okay, so I'm aiming for 10,000 a day. And in the Weekend Warrior Challenge, where are we? Where am I in the listing? Between me, Penny, and some of her work colleagues. Oh, fourth. That's not good. That's not good. Penny's behind me, though. So, that's okay. <laughs> No, I'm not at all competitive. I've never been, no. Um, but I guess Jesus was walking and uh, I guess he stayed pretty fit with all of that. So that, I think those are Leia's questions. So I'll put that over, over there. All right, so that's our first section here. Now, let's talk about um, the farming that's going on here. Um, the, the, the sowing of the farming. Um, I'd say that in some senses, Jesus' family are farmers. All that are in Jesus' family are farmers. I think that's part of what's going on here in the next section. A large crowd gathers, Jesus talks about sowing the seed, the farmer goes out and sows the seed, some goes on the path, some on the rocky ground, some on the ground that has thistles and thorns amongst it, and some in the good soil and produces a great crop. And then the disciples are like, mm, we don't quite get that, Jesus. Actually, if you look through the Gospels, that's quite a common refrain with the disciples. Uh, what was he really... Sometimes they talk amongst each other. What was, he, what was he talking about? Sometimes they debate with other people. Sometimes Jesus just knows they're confused. And sometimes he explains things. Sometimes he doesn't. On this occasion, he very specifically does explain it when they asked him. 
The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others I speak in parables so that, and he quotes from Isaiah chapter 6 here, though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. And then he goes on to explain the parable and uh, about the different soils and the different kinds of reception of God's word. The seed is God's word. How do people receive it? He's explaining the way that uh, people receive the word of God. And it ultimately, as we're sitting here, it describes the way that every single one of us here receives the word of God at some point in our lives since we're here. So let's, let me have a look at some questions from this section and see if we can answer these. Um, right. Can the sowing of the seeds represent different stages of our lives? It's a good question. What do you think? Let's just throw that out there for a minute. Can the sowing of the seeds, the different soils, the different reception of the seed represent different stages of our lives? Yeah. What do you think? In what way would that be the case? Yes? If so. In regards to the rocky ground, mm -hmm. I was probably as a teenager. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I'll answer everything in my best. Okay. So, nothing got fermented, nothing got germinated. It's just, you know, nothing was bounced out. off. It bounced off at that point when you were. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Leon? I guess the question is if, if, that's, if that is the case, could the good soil be followed by bad soil? Okay. Good question. Okay, the third soil appears to be good soil, right? It's just that it's got other stuff in it that's not good. So you've got two good soils, just one's infested, the other one isn't. And the other two seem to be not adequately positive soils. One's too shallow and the other one's just a hard path. So it's an interesting thought. I think um, given, this is by me my opinion, my opinion would be that I think we go through different phases of life, and there are some times in life when, um, if we heard the word, it would bounce off, and that's, that's the response. But I think as Jesus is teaching this, I think he's talking about the pattern of life, our, our ultimate decision, our ultimate uh, perspective, our ultimate uh, response to the word, ultimately. I think the good soil stays good, because it only, that's the only way it makes sense of the parable, that there are these different options. The good soil that is good stays good, as long as perseverance is part of what happens because he talks about persevering, producing a crop. So it seems like that's, that's the case. Why did the disciples need clarification? Because they were people like you and me <laughs> who often don't get it even when it's right in front of our faces. I mean, you know, Penny's been talking about doing more walking for ages. It took, it took her getting a Fitbit so I got competitive to actually listen to what she was saying. I mean, I should have been doing more walking already. You know what I'm saying, right? We, we, the obvious is really in front of us a lot of the time. And the disciples were just like that. I think they needed clarification not because the, the parable is complicated or because Jesus wasn't clear uh, or because they're particularly stupid. I think they're just like you and me. So I'm like, what, what was that about? I, that's quite my guess. I just think they were normal people. And they did hear a lot of teaching from Jesus and they probably needed to get clarification quite, quite often. Um, okay, um, oh, here's one from Elsie. So Elsie, this is for you, okay, in case you're watching, listening. Um, what is a parable? Spelt W-O-T. <laughs> so I don't know what they're teaching you at Lawrence Hank School. Uh, but uh, but uh, anyway, I, uh, she is six, right, so that's cool. What is a parable? Okay, give me, give me some definitions, people. What is a parable? Story with me. Earthly story with a spiritual meaning. Um, what was that one? Yeah, I just said, but well, I, I simplified it and said story with meaning. <laughs> story with meaning. A story taught by analogy. A, a story taught by analogy, a parallel idea or story that, yeah, okay. Anything else? I think that covers it. All right, so a parable is a way. Jesus used parables. Jesus wasn't the only person who told stories, but he used stories which were called parables. And he used, Elsie, he used parables to make something about God clear to us as human beings. Because we don't get God sometimes, because he's so big and huge and enormous and eternal and all that stuff. He's so phenomenal and fantastic. Because of that, we don't understand him sometimes. And so we need stories to help us understand. So Jesus told stories. So if you just listen to the stories, you'll understand more about God. Hope that's okay, Elsie. All right, so that's true for us, isn't it? We need stories. We need to read the stories. So I think that's what's going on there. Uh, OK. 
Okay, what else have we got here? The devil comes and takes away the seed. Somebody had a question about this. So this is in Jesus' explanation of the first soil, which is a path. The people who hear the devil comes, takes away the word from their heart so they may not believe and be saved. Why does this not take responsibility away from the soil, the person hearing the word? Does this take responsibility away? You know, the seed is sown, and the devil comes away and snatches it, so no responsibility is accorded to the person, right, the heart. That's an interesting question. I think it's really good. I like that. And somebody will answer it. So, uh, <laughs> now what do you think Jesus is trying to get across with that? What's, what's Jesus' point? Why does he tell us that? Let's, let's leave the question about the devil now aside for a minute, but why does Jesus tell it? Yeah? Maybe it's about the time taken to respond to it. The time taken to respond, you mean like it's not, not quick enough to yeah. respond? So if, if the seed was rooted, it wouldn't be well. Okay, if, if, there was, if, if there was time. Okay, yeah, there's, there's a time element sometimes. We don't act on what we hear, yeah? Okay. I think Jesus wanted us to be aware that the devil is out to get, to take it away. Okay. He wanted us to know that we have the enemy that is going to try and do that. Yes. Okay. We are in a spiritual battle. We have an enemy. We need to be aware of that. I think, with, as always with parables, we should not try and press a parable to be more detailed than it is, mm -hmm. or tell us more than we, than, it, than Jesus wanted to tell us. It's quite important that we don't look for detail in, uh, uh, explanations in every single detail. My, my thought would be it is what basically Oge okay, says, that uh, we have an enemy and if we don't act on, on the opportunities we, we get, then we're going to have a difficult time in seeing God make a difference in our lives. So, Leon? Maybe the sun and sun again is right. So, like, there's not like, like the only time the sun will ever show in our Could be. Could be. We're, we don't know. But I think the thing is we have an enemy. And we need to act on things when we, we hear them. Okay, uh, another bit on this one. Um, okay, do those who do not mature, this is the third soil, right? Those who do not mature because of life's worries, riches, and pleasures, do they not make it to heaven or are they just in danger of not making it to heaven? Okay, good question, right? This one, think about this. Um, the, the seed that fell among thorns, verse 14, stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. So, are they in danger? They're going to be okay? They are not going to be okay? Uh, what, are your, what are the thoughts here for us? What about this one, this question? In danger, or they're not going to go to be with God forever? They're not going to be saved? They're not going to go to heaven. How would we think about this question based on what Jesus is saying here? Any thoughts? No one wants to commit themselves to a judgment on this matter? <laughs> ah, it's tricky sometimes. This stuff is tricky, isn't it? it is, especially when we're thinking about it right in the middle of things. I mean, just thinking about the spirit of Jesus, I mean, we always have second, third, fourth, and fifth chances with him. He's always unconditional. He always allows us a chance to um, respond mm -hmm. directly. So when I think about the overall spirit of, of God and his heart, then in my mind it has to be, you know, another chance. It has to be another chance. Okay. It could be another chance, yes. Yeah, part of that, I'd like to think if you've given your life, you know, you've done you've, that commitment with God, you know, you've been baptised or whatever, where you've done it, mm -hmm. And I'd like to think that you're secure, if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, despite what happens on that road. But, you know, if your heart is with God, even other things are coming. Yeah, you end up, hopefully. <laughs> I don't know. Excellent. I mean, I think it depends on whether we get to the point where we're completely choked or not. That's, I think that's the thing, right? Because it says that they're choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures. Not just they're tempted, and not just they sin from time to time, although they have ups and downs. Things are different. So that's, that's, well, ups and downs, ups and downs. Um, but they're choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures. Now choking seems to me to be quite terminal in, in that sense. So it's, I think it's about a direction of travel where we start in a good place, we have some challenges, do we persevere? What, what's interesting to me is that he says choked by not life's sadness or worry, but life's riches and pleasures. 
Mm -hmm. No, but it also does say cares. So into everybody's life, worries will come. Yeah. Problems will come, right? Worries will come. Riches don't always come. Riches don't always come. <laughs> Though frankly, frankly, even amongst us here, the, the poorest of us is still incredibly wealthy by world, world standards, right? Yeah. None of us are likely to, to be starving to death anytime soon. So riches is relative, and even and pleasures. We all have pleasures, some at least. So I think it's about the choking. And so I suppose. I think what Jesus is trying to say is to ask us to, to look at our own lives and our own spiritual walk and say, are we choking? Are we are we on that way? Are we on that? Are we choking or are we are we uh, healing? Are we you know, ups and downs are fine, but uh, where, what's the trajectory? Where are we going? In? Are the worries taking over? Are the pleasures taking over? Are the riches taking over, or are they just? A temptation and a struggle from time to time. Seems to me that that's part of what's going on here. I read uh, an article in uh, Premier Christianity magazine uh, this week on um, the, the, the challenges of the smartphone culture era and spirituality and how that impacts our um, devotion to God. Uh, you know, and when we get distracted, because part of what we're dealing with here is distractions, things that take our focus off of God. And I've got a few numbers for you. Now, statistics have to be handled with a little bit of skepticism, but they do say something. So let me give you these. Uh, I think these are UK statistics. Um, apparently, smartphones in numbers. The average user spends 3.6 hours a day on their smartphone. 3.6 hours a day. Doing what? Various things, but, you know, it's a long time. One in eight people in the UK are addicted to their smartphone. One in eight. Even as some of us are holding our smartphones. And um, uh, it, I don't know what I don't know how they referred to it. Was it they, they said they were addicted, they admitted to it, I don't know, but that, that's it's a number. 50, uh, 54%, 54% of people in the United Kingdom said that the constant checking of phones at the dinner table is the most likely cause of a dinner time argument. Wow. Checking the phone at the dinner table. Mm. <laughs> choking on... The, oh, yes, choking on our smartphone. Uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge, isn't it? And I, 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 I don't know about you, but I do like my communications and I like my phone. And I like its various things it does, including its Fitbit um, app. That's not an advert. I have no shares there. But, uh, <laughs> but it... It is interesting. Something I've done recently because it does dominate, and I carry it everywhere all the time. And uh, but I, I've turned off almost all notifications. I've turned I turn the ringer off almost all the time. And, uh, to, and the thing when it goes ping when an email arrives, turn it off. It's just uh, I twitch, you know. And, I'm, and, and no one's going to die if I don't answer an email in the next two minutes, <laughs> you know. And so I turn I turn it off. The sound off most of the time. All the notifications. I don't know how many emails are waiting for me on my email thing. I just turn that notification off because it just stresses me out and stops me thinking about, I think, more spiritual things when I need to. Now, when I need, need to answer email, I'll answer my email. But I don't want to have to look at that when I don't have to do it because it does distract me. And so that's I've done some of, of those things uh, and made a decision I would not. I will uh, not look at my email until I have to during the day. So I don't look at my email when I wake up. I used to. I don't do that anymore. Um, I do my Bible study. I have some prayer first. And uh, maybe some other things that are more important before I look at my email. Um, that's what I'm doing. And I'm also uh, looking at it less later in the evening. Um, and, uh, and if I am looking at it, I'm not doing emails. Like after about nine o'clock at night, I'm trying to look at it as little as possible, unless it's just entertainment value of some kind. But it's not. I'm not looking for emails. I'm not checking those late at night. And I don't get that right every day, and I can't always do that every day. But I do that more and more often now. And I, I feel it's easier for me doing that to connect with God when I need to connect with God. And I'm not laying that out there as a rule or a law for anybody else. But I think it's important for us to think through how we use the tools that God has given us. 
how we engage with the pleasures that God has given us, how we engage with the riches that God has given us, and how we respond to the worries that come in life. How are we responding? Are we mindful of that? Are we conscious of how these things are affecting us? And do we then have a strategy to do is deal with it in a way that will help us to still know that God is there and God is with us so that we can, by persevering, produce a good crop, a good harvest? I think that's really important. Um, okay, finishing off these questions. Um, where am I? Which seed? Well, you're... You're not the seed, you're the soil, because uh, the seed is the word of God. But uh, yeah, where, where, which soil are we? Well, I mean, I'm not going to, I don't know uh, where all of us are, are with that, which, which soil are we here? But I do think that in, in, in looking into the word of God and asking ourselves whether we're practicing it, we can soon find out. And that people around us will notice one day. That's the second part here about the, fam the, uh, the light. Because it's interesting that he follows on from the thing about the soils with the... Uh, the light, talking about the light, that it doesn't get hidden in a, J cloth, a clay jar or put under a bed, they, you put it on a stand. So I think, what are the family of, of Jesus like? What are they like? They're, they're farmers. Um, we, 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 cause I think we're, we're to follow Jesus and sowing the word. Um, but we're also, um, his family light up the room. We light up where we go. We, we're living out our faith living out the Word of God, then people notice, don't they? I mean, if they don't notice, then something's probably wrong. Uh, they may not notice uh, on the first time they meet us, but if they know us, then they will know where our light comes from, where, um, where our joy comes from. And they'll know about us as Christians. The family lights up the room. Um, if someone has a passion for something, a hobby or anything, right? If they have a passion, you just know about it. Uh, you don't have to ask them. In fact, if you tell them, you must not talk about your passion. It, it just, it, you know, they'll have a breakup. I mean, they just, because you can't, right? If you're really excited about something. We all know that, um, that uh, uh, the, the things that matter about us when we get to know each other. We know that Leon's a photographer. We know that Sarah and, and Becky have craft um, blood in their veins. Um, <laughs> and uh, and we, we know these things about uh, one another. It's obvious. Sean has his motorbike. And we know that because he's got his helmet with him. <laughs> and his motorbike's outside. But you know, if you know somebody, you know what's important to them. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. If we hold on to his word and live it out, then everybody will see. That's just what happens. How will we know which soil we are? Well, we won't know t today necessarily, but we will know over a period of time. The people around us will know. And how, hopefully they'll help us with that. Um, so that's that one. Um, I like this question. Okay. It sounds like Jesus is asking the impossible. Um, he tells people to listen and understand, but he needs to explain the parable to the disciples and says that he uh, talks in parables pretty much to confuse people. Why is this? That's a great question, isn't it? I think the answer comes down to the fact that Jesus doesn't tell parables, I don't believe, to deliberately confuse, but he tells parables because it's the way that people reveal in themselves whether they are truly curious and truly seeking God. It's, it's a way of sifting those who are really actually interested in Him and what He has to say. And I think in that way we reveal in ourselves, you know, th those of us who have a question about Jesus and about the Bible but don't dig in, then it says something about our, tr our sincerity or lack of it in trying to un understand God and Jesus and what it means to be a Christian. But those of us who get confused by something in the Bible, but then dig in to find out an answer, that shows what kind of heart we have. And Jesus used stories to reveal the hearts of the people around him. And even so they themselves would know, I think, what's going on there. There's probably more we could say about that, but not today. I've got one last question, which is the deepest of all, so I'm going to save that to the end. Um, Jesus' family are farmers, Jesus' family lights up the room, and Jesus' family practice his word. And that's what he says at the very end here. That they hear God's word, verse 21, and put it into practice. I imagine if I was the mother of Jesus or one of his brothers, and we've travelled some distance to try and see him, and you can't get through the crowd, surely you expect that if you're a family, you'd get preferential treatment, right? You go to the front of the queue. And they can't, the, the crowd are crowded around Jesus, and they can't get in, and uh, I would feel rather frustrated. 
And I'd feel quite annoyed at Jesus, personally, like, we're here, we're your family, let us in, you know, and there's something going, going on here, I don't think I would be very relaxed about that. I think I'd be quite annoyed um, and frustrated. They're there, we don't know why they're there, we don't know whether they have just come out of no agenda just to say hello, you know, like, Jesus, how you, how you doing? We don't know if uh, they've come out of compassion. That they're worried about him. Another passage talks about they think he's uh, not eating properly and, uh, and that they're, he's out of his mind. Maybe there's compassion. Or maybe they've come um, because they want to set him straight. Like, who do you think you are? We do know that Jesus' brothers didn't believe in him, John chapter 7. But later, and to me this is one of the most inspiring things here that uh, we'll conclude on really, which is that Jesus' own harvest in his own family was delayed. His mother and his brothers did not believe in him at this stage. And so he looks at the crowd around him, and they at that point are the first soil, I guess. The seed is landing on them, on the path. And they're not responding. I mean, they know Jesus better than anybody, and they're not responding, right? So I think that the, the seed on the path is actually at this point Jesus' mother and brothers. And what a temptation to write them off. What a temptation to feel down, like, I'm no good. Jesus could feel like, I'm just a rubbish messiah. I can't even convert my own mother and brothers. It's, you know, who am I to preach to all these people? I mean, you can feel like that. And sometimes we can feel like that because we're very conscious of our own weaknesses and failings and things we would like to have seen happen that God hasn't done yet and all that stuff, right? But Jesus doesn't go and get into that. He says, if you want to know who my real family are, it's those who hear what I've been saying and put it into practice. I would love for everybody in this crowd to be a fourth soil. And I would love for my mother and brothers, I think at least in his head he's thinking, to be that fourth soil. So, who knows? But he doesn't get distracted. He doesn't get deflected. He carries on. And he himself perseveres. That's part of the thing, the patience and the perseverance here of the farmer. And he carries on being a light himself. Carries on farming, carries on being a light, carries on inspiring people, carries on building the family, uh, a spiritual family, carries on proclaiming the kingdom of God. And the ultimate result is that his mother and his brothers come to believe in him. Two or three years later, in Acts chapter 1, we know that uh, this is the fruit, this is the harvest that ultimately comes. I mean, Jesus wasn't in the room, but I, I guess he knew, right? Being the Son of God. But in chapter 1, verse 14 of Acts, they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. See, there was a harvest, a great harvest, 30, 60, 100 times. Who knows what that harvest produced because he persevered. It's, it's unimaginable, but he had a harvest because he persevered amongst his own family in this in instance. And I, I think it'd be good for us to think about what areas do we need to persevere on before we'll see a harvest. It may not come to that. It may not come tomorrow. It may come in a few years from now. It may come after we've left, left this earth because it seems like that harvest for Jesus came after he died and resurrected. So maybe, but, but our lives can produce great harvest, a great crop, if we persevere with the word of God. I want to read one, one last scripture and then we'll, um, we'll pray and take bread and wine. We're going to take communion in a moment. Uh, and I want to read John uh, 12. And if you'd like to turn there with me, we'll sort of meditate on this as we then take the bread and wine. And I hope this answers the last, deepest question from Sean. I, and I can't answer all of this question. It is very deep. But has the world changed since the beginning of time? Have people changed from the beginning of the time? Is the world worked out? Have we worked out what life is all about? Well, that's a, a ten-part sermon series right there. <laughs> um, but what I would say just for today is... Jesus gives us the answers to that in this sense, that however people have changed and however the world has changed, if we hold on to Jesus and his teachings, then we have a great future and we can be useful to God and produce a great harvest for him and we can have joy in our hearts 
and we can be changed. I don't know if I can change the world, but I think God can change me. And if God can change me, maybe I can help somebody else. Maybe we can help other people in, well, in Watford and Chesham and Chorleywood and Bushy and North Wolf, and all the places that, that we live. If God can change us, he can use us to change others. What does it take? It takes this in John 12. Think about this. John 12, and uh, let's read here in verse 23. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So we take the image of sowing from Luke 8, and now we transfer it into John 12, where Jesus is himself the seed who dies for us, so that we could join his family. What a, what, a, what, a, what a privilege. And we take the bread and wine to remind us of what it cost Jesus, that he died, he shed his blood, and he gave his body, broken, so that we could be part of his family. He died so that we could live. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you for Jesus for Jesus, is for his life, for his teaching, for his compassion, for his convictions, for his obedience to you, God, for his perseverance through life. We thank you that he was not distracted, even by his own family. And we thank you that he taught us the mysteries of the kingdom of God, so that we could come to know you. And we really thank you right now, God, just for him dying so that we could know you. Dying so that we could live. And we celebrate that as we take bread and wine right now. And we're grateful for the breaking of his body. We're grateful for the shedding of his blood. And we pray that you'll, be, you'll help us always to be grateful that we are his family. We pray in Jesus' name.